And we are live and back on the third day of the Virtual Developers Conference. Hi, everybody out there on the internet. It's great to have you. It's great to be back. Um, Aditya, what was your takeaway from the previous session? I mean, women and empowerment. Yeah, it was a really amazing one. And we really needed that because there's a huge gap between male counterparts and female in the tech industry. And empowering women, just like uh, Zulaika and our uh, co-speaker said, uh, it's just really important to do that. Uh, make more women, attract, attract more women to the field. Uh, it's just better. We have more point of, uh, more opinions, different kind of point of views. And it's just, it just means a better community for us all. Absolutely, I agree on that. And as we were talking about, it, it also has to start at home and there needs to be some learning process and, and improvement on the male side of the world. And yeah, with that, I'm super happy that we can actually welcome two ladies in for our next two guests. Um, welcome Elise and Anna Lind. Um, how are you doing? Good. It's my first experience doing an online conference. So this is quite exciting. Yes. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> great, great, great. So I'm I'm having a look. Um, agile consultant in South Africa, as well as a coach and in kick incognito Wonder Woman. Wow, these are these are, these are great titles. Um, yeah. Maybe let's start with with Anna Lind as an agile coach uh, consultant. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, well, I'm from Johannesburg in South Africa. I'm an Agile consultant, as you mentioned, with IQ Business in South Africa. And the way Elise and I connected is through Mauritius Commercial Bank. All right. Over to you, Elise. Yeah, so you might have picked up from my accent that I am Australian. Uh, so I moved to Mauritius uh, late, well, the middle of last year to work at MCB and I work with the digital teams, helping them to modernize the way that they work so that we can deliver more value to MCB's customers. All right, great, great, great. Um, picking up on, on the first, uh, on the topic that we had in the previous talk, empowerment of women, what's your take on that? Uh, maybe Elise starting? Yeah, so I think one of the things that we know from creating value for customers is that if you're servicing a diverse array of people, uh, you need a diverse array of people uh, who are designing those products. So it doesn't make sense to have a male-dominated team or a team made up entirely of Caucasian people. It just doesn't result in the best quality products. So when I talk about empowering women, I, I think it's important just so that, you know, we have equality and everybody has the opportunity to shine. But it also ends with, you know, real business value in doing that. So it's really in the best interest, not just of women, but of everybody who cares about creating value and creating really cool products. Okay. Anna Lind, what's so your point? Summit, um I mean, I don't have any kind of revolutionary points to make. Um, just I'm glad that it's kind of becoming more of a normal thing to discuss and a normal thing to kind of think about and try to navigate because um, I think a lot of the companies and kind of groups in society still have a long way to go um, in terms of, you know, having a diverse workforce and like the pay gap, you know, all these things. So I don't want to go too deep into that rabbit hole, but I'm really glad that it's busy, you know, kind of being on the radar more often. Yeah, indeed, indeed. And I, and I think that um, with the situation of the pandemic, uh, it, it was kind of a catalysator to, you know, bring certain topics faster onto the surface that they get addressed uh, with the remote work situation, uh, working from home and, and having this diversity in the teams. And that actually um, the job gets done um, independent on, on where you are located. And I mean, with the extra load that might come from the household with the children, um, I've seen the experience that the job gets done even in a better way, especially then from women. All right, let's move over, if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, 
Let's move. What is what is the topic? Okay, oh, no. so uh, we're going to be talking about why we think robots uh, are coming for for all of our jobs, uh, and what we think that you can do to sort of make yourself resilient in the face of those challenges. All right, all right. Do you think they're going to take our job as hosts and moderators for a conference in the future? Oh, quite possibly. <laughs> But it's all right. We're going to tell you. We're going to tell you how to survive the robot revolution. <laughs> I did, Joe. Yeah. What is it? <laughs> I'm saying I'm just hoping that they don't turn out to be terminators. Yes, so do I. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> Let's let's kick it off. I'm seeing that you have some slides prepared. Um, all right, I'm moving over to you. Excellent. Cool. Okay, so thank you all for coming along uh, to today's talk. Uh, Anna, Linda and I want this to be as engaging as possible for you all. So we put a few little audience participation moments throughout the talk. To be involved in these, you need to use your phone or your laptop and visit Slido, okay? So that's sli.do, and it's going to ask you for an event code. We've come up with a really inventive event code for today's talk, which is robots. So if you type that in, uh, there won't be any participation that's live uh, right this moment, but Anna Linda will let you know when it's your turn to, to get involved. So, like we said, we're here to talk about why the robots are coming for our jobs and what you can do in order to really survive this revolution. Uh, if I can, having a little bit of trouble at progressing my slides, so I apologize if it takes a few moments. So we've, we've already introduced ourselves. Uh, if you do want to continue the conversation with us after the talk, Uh, you can connect with us on Twitter. Our Twitter handle's there. Your best bet is to connect with Anna Linda because she's all over Twitter. I post approximately once a year, but if you do tag me or you do send me a direct message, I, I do promise that I will uh, respond. <laughs> so, Anna Linda. Cool. So the one thing I didn't mention in my introduction, which uh, you may uh, have noticed already on the slide is that I've been known to communicate using quite a lot of GIFs. So I thought we'd just use one just to get us going and to say hello from a beautiful little pug. Um, so now that we've really said hello and introduced everything, we'd like to share some background into the changing landscape in the technology industry. So now is when you can go over to Slido and um, tell us a little bit about yourself. We'd like to know who's in the audience today um, how long have you been a software developer? And there is an option for if you have not been a software developer, so that's also okay. It's just for us to get an idea who's in the room. Okay. <laughs> okay, great. I see some answers popping in there. Okay. Oh, a surprising number of not software developers. Wow, okay. Yeah. This is cool. I expected the not software developers to be very much in the uh, in the, in the low minority. Zeros or ones. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, great. We're not going to spend too much longer here, but it's really cool to see who's in the audience. Wow, so we've got quite a few people who have kind of been around the block quite a lot. That's that's really cool. So, um, wow, the numbers are changing. Okay, <laughs> actually quite a good split. If I keep watching, I'm just going to keep talking about this graph. So, okay, so it's really lovely to have you all here with us today. Um, we'd like to start off by taking a little trip down memory lane back to the year 2000. Can you even remember that far back? In 2000, You're a developer, you're coding, and you may be alone or sitting in a group of developers, but you're probably all working on different projects. Shown here is one of the most advanced, albeit very bulky and heavy, computers in 2000, as well as the three biggest tech companies, as shown in a global ranking for 2000. Microsoft, IBM, and Intel. 
So now if we fast forward one decade and we place our cursors on 2010, now you're a developer, you're coding, and you need to test as well. So the skill set is busy expanding. And you may be working with other people quite a little bit more. By this time, the first generation iPad has been launched and Google has appeared on the scene out of nowhere, shooting up to third place in the ranking. So let's do another time jump to March this year. You're a developer, you're coding, you're collaborating. There's probably a lot of post-it notes involved. You're continuously learning new technologies and potentially you're involved in the whole product development cycle. Technically, things have changed quite a bit. You don't need to know COBOL and Fortran anymore. You need to learn Swift and React. You might have a Ruby on Rails side project going and a cluster of Raspberry Pis controlling something in your home. There's also a much higher level of human interaction now with small cross-functional teams being the order of the day. What did teamwork look like for us? We were co-located, we were involved in collaborative delivery, we had face-to-face -face meetings and even shared stationery, which now seems like a distant memory. We had lunch and learn, problem solving workshops and something I personally really, really miss, the occasional beer with the team. So if we move on and, and just take a look at how things have changed just physically over the last roughly 50 years, it's quite incredible. Over the last 50 years, we've gone from the large oh, floppy disks, that's what we call them here, to going to storage that you can access from any device in any location with a simple login. This is pretty mind blowing. I wonder what will be happening in 2030, which is just around the corner. It seems that human imagination is the only limit. So Annalind has described quite phenomenal changes in the industry over the last 20 years and suggested that bigger, uh, more frequent changes are going to come for us in the next 10 to 20 years as well. To prepare ourselves for those changes, we think it's useful to take a moment to reflect and understand why the world, or particularly the technology world, looks different today compared to back in 2000 at the turn of the millennium. So what do we think is the cause of this? Okay, Anna Linda and I have a few, have a few theories. I noticed on the, uh, the Slido poll that we had a few people who have been working in the industry for longer than 10 years. So you might remember back around the year 2000, the really poor reputation that the technology industry had. It was this feeling that every time somebody built a software project, it either went over budget, over time, didn't deliver value for customers, uh, or maybe it just didn't even work. And this idea about the technology industry just being not very good was so prevalent that somebody made a Wikipedia page to track all these failed projects. And this feeling led to, to a group of, of software engineers kind of getting together and saying, like, enough is enough. We need to change the way that our industry operates and introduce new ways of building software. And this led to a kind of explosion of different methodologies, new ways of working. Now, we could deep dive in each of these, but it's going to take forever. So we're not going to do that today. But if you're interested, connect with us afterwards. The key thing about the, all of these different technologies is that they really reinforced a more collaborative way of working. And that fundamentally changed the way that teams within our industry were composed. Back in the year 2000, if you were a developer, you were probably in a discipline-based team where the only people you worked with every day were other developers. And that had some benefits because you all had the same interests, uh, you had the same expertise, you talked the same language. That made things kind of easy in some perspectives. But it has some drawbacks, and that's led us to working in what we call cross-functional teams. And Really, if you look at high-performing teams all around the world, there would be few of them that weren't cross-functional in, in some sort of way these days. 
And this has led to a change in what's expected of developers because you now need to be able to communicate with, relate to, and work with people who don't have the same expertise. People like business analysts or designers who talk in a very different language. So this has very much impacted the work landscape for software engineers. And I know that um, a bunch of you on the call aren't software developers. This has probably impacted you as well because you are either sort of in a business analysis team, maybe a testing team or a design team in the, the past, and now you're all mixed up in one of these cross functions. Now, it's not just the way that we've composed our teams that has changed in the last 20 years. The focus of the industry has also shifted dramatically. If you're old enough to remember using the internet in the year 2000, I am old enough for this, you'll remember that it was really just like a repository of information. Instead of going to an encyclopedia or a physical book to look up information, you could now look up text on the internet. If you wanted to engage with a business, uh, you could look up information that they typically post out to you in a catalogue or a flyer online. But there wasn't a whole heap of interactivity. The sort of interactivity you might expect is if you had to sign up for something with a business, instead of filling in a paper-based form, you'd fill in the same form, but it'd be on the internet. And what is... Uh, common with these different things that were on the internet in 2000 was that we were basically taking uh, things that existed in the real world, ways of creating value that existed in the real world, and we were just finding a way to digitize them and put them on the internet. And these problems are quite easy to solve with your typical software engineering, analytical coding skill set. But these days, with the rise of some of the companies Annalinda mentioned earlier, your Googles, your Amazons, Facebooks, there's now a shift. It's not just about digitizing uh, value that we had previously. It's about using digital tools to create new products and new types of value for customers. And this is what we call innovation. This has had a profound impact on the industry because the skills that you need just to digitize something that already exists are very different than the skills that you need to innovate. And don't worry, we'll tell you what those skills are in a little bit. Now, this is we this is the, the kind of main topic. This is what we, we named our talk after, right? One of the, the dramatic changes that we've seen recently is the rise in technological advancements. Okay, Anna Linda showed you that beautiful picture showing how storage has changed over time. But it's not just storage that changed. We've also had a rise in artificial intelligence, machine learning, and that whole kind of cluster of different technologies. If you take a look at this image, you'll see that for our industry, we're the one at the top, technology, media, and telecommunications, people are that. 15% to 20% of people think that AI is already having a large effect on our industry. If you look five years ahead, people are saying that 70% of people are saying it's going to have a really big impact. So when I think about what this could actually mean for people working in the technology industry, the first and obvious insight you could come to is, well, I better start learning how to code, run, and maintain AI. That's where the industry is going. Like, I should head in that direction too, and that's the skill set I should focus on. But we think that there's a deeper insight that you should also think about from this perspective. And it's not just us that, that share this feeling. Uh, data, uh, sorry, Evans Data Corporation did a survey of a big group of uh, developers uh, four years ago, where they asked them what was their biggest worry about their careers. Now, interestingly, these developers didn't say, you know, they were worried about the opportunity for promotion, higher pay, uh, you know, more snacks in the, the office, any of those sorts of things that you would typically expect. The majority of people said that their biggest fear was that their role as developers would be replaced by artificial intelligence. So the technology industry is changing in a way where it means I don't just need to change the focus of my skills, 
I need to ask the question of, is my skill set relevant at all in the future? Now, it's not just 550 developers that feel this way. When you start looking a little bit deeper into this, you can find a whole heap of articles on the internet about how the landscape for software engineering is, is changing, okay? We're no longer going to be programming computers. We're going to be training artificial intelligence. There's some research um, or some reporting from New Scientist on uh, Microsoft's decoder program, which is now able to uh, steal lines of code from open source programs, rearrange them to create novel computer programs. Okay. Honestly, these programs are only about five lines of code long, so it's not like they're particularly complex, but it's showing the potential for what can happen as AI technology continues to develop. And this article that came out, or a piece of research that came out of the US, talks about the fact that potentially by 2040, humans will no longer be writing the majority of computer programs. Most of it is going to be written by AI. So there's certainly a lot of people who are saying, you know what, the industry is changing in such a way that the role of the developer is going to change significantly. So if you want to see what this could look like in real life, I'm going to show you a quick video. This is using uh, an artificial intelligence technology called GPT-3. It was created by uh, OpenAI, which is a lab in San Francisco in the US. What you're going to see in this video is a text box at uh, the sort of top of the screen where a human is inputting uh, some natural language describing a layout for, for a screen that they want. Below that, the AI is going to generate the HTML and CSS required to render that. And then below that, again, you're going to see the actual rendering that is created by the AI. So let's give this a go. Okay. So they've asked for a button that looks like a watermelon. The AI is thinking about it, processing this, coming up with some HTML, and then below that you've got a big pink area, just like the inside of a watermelon, and a green outside. Okay, now we're asking for a title that says, welcome to my newsletter and a blue subscribe button. Okay, they've adjusted what they asked for because the text came back white, and now you can see this big red, welcome to my newsletter. And then here, we're going to have a button for every color of the rainbow. So there's more to this video. We just wanted to give you a really quick insight. It's worth taking a look, and we will share the link to this. But the main thing here is, yes, it's only generating at this point in time a basic layout. There's not a lot of interactivity in what is being created. But this is the direction that we're moving in. Thanks for sharing that with us. I find it really um, interesting. <laughs> So many of these technological changes that uh, will inevitably affect us all. And what really matters is how we respond to them. So if we think about the way work has changed just since March this year, now we're working online only. We've probably set up a space at home to work. At the beginning, I think it felt really foreign. And now it, I think we've gotten used to it. And we even may have more flexibility about how and when we work. And along with a new way of doing things, we also have a new set of challenges, including audio problems, connectivity challenges, video call fatigue, potentially feeling a bit isolated or disconnected, and constantly using 2020's most famous phrases. Elise, I'm sharing my screen. Can you see it? Oh, Tell not yet, Anna Linda. <laughs> it's coming. <laughs> Okay, so right now we'd like you to head over to Slido again and answer the second of our three questions. And we'd like to hear more about your specific context. So please would you tell us what has changed for you since March this year? Anything that has changed for you? <laughs> okay, let's give it a moment. Let's see some answers popping up there. So from my own personal perspective, I mean, I'm not going to type it into Slido right now. But um, I've been really enjoying being able to spend way more time with my husband and my dogs. So that's been really cool. Um, 
constantly being on my laptop has been a little bit frustrating and I've had to go to the physio way more often uh, for my back than what I would have liked. I think she's going to buy a nice retirement home. <laughs> so, okay, great. I see some answers are popping up. More wine. Okay, great. That's That sounds like a, an improvement. Um, depends if you're drinking it for enjoyment or like as a coping mechanism. <laughs> Okay, being distracted, um, sore back, yeah, I can identify with that. So many online tools, online courses, great. Working more, yeah, I think that's that's been a common theme that we've seen as well. Okay, great. Thank you so much for sharing a little bit more about your context with us. It's really interesting to see how people's lives have been affected in a different way. Um, so if we think back to some of the stats that Elise took us through, not enough chocolate. <laughs> I can relate. I can relate. Absolutely. <laughs> so moving along, if we look back at the stats that Elise took us through, we foresee a future that's going to bring with it an even bigger emphasis on cross-functional collaboration and customer-driven innovation. We mm. see technological advancements zooming past us at an incredible speed. And we also see a future that is specifically more remote focused. So it seems like these changes would place quite a high demand on us, and it may be daunting or perhaps even overwhelming. If we take a moment to think and ask ourselves how many of these challenges could realistically be addressed by writing more, different or better code? Well, by all means, please do keep coding. And if you can teach your dog how to do this, even better. So some of the upcoming changes could definitely be addressed through our coding methods and improving on our good practices continuously, but definitely not all of them. So this is an interesting insight because it makes it obvious now that in order to stay resilient to any of the changes that we face in the industry, the answer isn't to just focus on the skills that we've already mastered and improve them a little bit more. We actually need to expand our thinking now and focus on entirely different types of skills. When I introduce this idea to some people, it really freaks them out. And the reason it freaks them out is that traditionally we've been encouraged to form our skills in what we call an I shape. Okay? The reason for this I shape or the idea behind it is that we're experts in a narrow area of skills. Being an expert is really cool, okay? It can make you feel confident. It feels nice when you're able to explain something to somebody else, when you can quickly solve problems. It just feels really great. But the problem is if our eye shape, our area of expertise is not what's in demand in the future, then we're not really flexible and resilient um, and able to adapt to the changes that are coming. Our recommendation, therefore, is to develop your skill set into what we call a more modern T-shape. This does not mean abandoning your area of expertise. The middle of the T is still, you know, an I-shape. It's still a really deep expertise in one area. But what you do now to give yourself that flexibility and the adaptability is to start broadening your skill set as well. You don't need to be an expert in everything. That's really hard to do. You're going to burn out. It's not going to work well for you. So for your broader skills, this is where you're just looking to, to kind of know these skills at a beginner to moderate level. You don't have to be able to, to be the expert in everything. The big question then is, what skills should you look to in include in your repertoire? And our advice for this is to think really strategically about what's going to place you best in the future. Now, we know that robots, or AI, robots sounds way cooler, are exceptionally good at syntax and logic. They're advanced computers, and syntax and logic is what computers do. We know that robots are always going to be better at that than humans. So what distinguishes us from robots is our ability to think and act and collaborate with humans. And so this is where we encourage you to focus your skills, okay? Differentiate yourself by robot, from the robots, not by trying to be better at them at their game, but be better at them 
as a human being. So this is the takeaway message for you. If you want to beat the robots, soft skills are where you want to focus. And if you don't know what soft skills are, we'll talk about it now. Hard skills are the skills that are usually easier for people to understand. They're the core competencies of your role, the sorts of things that you would be asked to demonstrate in a technical interview. So your ability to program in various languages, to use different testing frameworks, uh, to be able to use source control, uh, and to be able to you know, implement different types of patterns. On the other hand, the soft skills are the skills that are a bit more intangible. They're harder to measure. They feel a little bit more like airy-fairy. Let's demonstrate this with some real examples to, to make it kind of think in a bit more concrete for you. These are some hard skills that are in high demand. They're not all of the hard skills that exist in the world, but you can probably relate to these and you've got a bit of an understanding of what they are. They're lots of different kind of computing, analytical, logic-based skills. On the other hand, your soft skills are these really human skills, okay? Persuasion, the, the ability to influence somebody. Creativity, the ability to create something new and novel. Collaboration, your ability to work well with others. So these are the things that we think should be your focus because right now humans are far better than robots at doing these types of activities and behaviours. At this point, when I'm having this conversation with people from the technology industry, I often get this question. They'll sort of look at me and they go, oh, well, that's really interesting, Elise. That's an interesting take. But uh, the technology industry is all about computation, logic, and syntax. Why would we even need soft skills? And it's actually quite an interesting question. Uh, and for us, we think that there is fundamentally a role for soft skills in the industry. It isn't just about computation, and we're going to tell you why. Right, so, I mean, humans are inherently so creative, and creative thinking is undeniably linked with innovation. And innovation is that key that we want to keep in our hands to allow us to adapt constantly to our customers' needs and also to stay ahead of the competition. So right now, we'd like to move over to our last question on Slido and ask you, who is responsible for innovation? Who do you think innovative ideas come from? Humans, I like it. Humans, yeah, that's good. CEO, designers, everyone. That's cool. Yeah, so we've got quite a few good in inputs there, actually. Um, I was expecting maybe more like specific groups. Um, <laughs> Elon Musk. <laughs> yeah, let's not go there. Oh, wow. Got a whole bunch oh, of new ones. Late night after alcohol. That's an interesting one. <laughs> I'm interested in finding out what those innovative ideas that happen late at night after alcohol Absolutely. are. Right. I'm just keeping a quick eye on the time, and I think we're a little behind, so I'm going to move on. Um, thank you so much for your inputs. It seems we have a variety of answers, and I think the reality is that innovation can happen at any time and could originate from any person or interaction. So we may be stifling creativity and slowing innovation down, if we rely on specific people or groups to come up with new ideas. And reality is we don't have the luxury of waiting for other people to do that. Ain't nobody got time for that. More specifically, for innovation to occur, it occurs where business, customer and technology meet. And we could say this is like a very, very happy marriage or maybe for some of us a really successful Tinder date. As a developer, you can understand the business priority by working closely with the product owner and other stakeholders. Customers heartbeat by collaborating closely with the designer in your team, people from marketing and research, and of course, the customer themselves. As developers, you're inherently clued up on technology trends already. So this is where the magic happens. 
as developers, you are most well placed to come up with innovative ideas in your organization. You are right at the heart of things. It's this focus on the importance of developers in the innovation process that leads us to this question that's on the screen now. How would you describe the color red to somebody who can't see? This might seem like a very odd question to ask somebody, but it's actually one of the key questions that we include in the interviews for all of the developers uh, that come uh, to, to interview at our digital factory at MCB. The reason that we ask this question of developers is that we recognize that the key skill set that you need to be innovative includes the ability to empathize. Empathy, if you're not familiar with this concept, is basically the ability to relate to other human beings, to understand how they're feeling, and to care about them. Now, empathy is essential for innovation because if you're unable to think about the situation from the perspective of a customer, you're never going to understand their pain points and you're never going to be able to come up with suggestions for how to uh, address those pain points. I think that there's a really great example in Mauritius of people using empathy during lockdown to come up with great product ideas. If you're, if you're living in Mauritius at the time and you remember when we weren't allowed to leave our homes to go to the supermarket, very quickly companies came up with the idea of delivering food to the customers. That was really cool. That was great. But where the empathy came in was the person who realised that Mauritians didn't just need food to get through lockdown, they also needed alcohol to get through the boredom that we were all facing. And very soon after people opened up these food delivery stores, somebody created a beer delivery store. And this is an exact example of how understanding how people are feeling at a particular point in time can help you come up with a good innovative idea. To be innovative though, you can't just rely on empathy. You have to be creative. And this is because very rarely do we come up with the best idea as our first idea. So if we're empathetic, we can understand the customer pain point and the problem but we need creativity in order to come up with a big suite of potential solutions because invariably some of them won't work, customers won't like them, or technically we just won't be able to, get, to introduce them. So to contribute to an innovative environment, you also need to know various different brainstorming techniques and ideation techniques so that you can ensure that you've got an array of potential solutions to solve problems. Now, similarly, it's very rarely that one individual has the whole innovative solution and implementation design in their head. Innovation is a team game. What usually happens when we come up with great ideas is somebody comes up with the seed of an idea that's kind of okay, it's, it's good, not amazing, and then somebody else builds off that idea. They introduce their own perspective, their own lens on the problem, we talked a little bit earlier about diversity, and this is where it really comes into the innovation process. So if you want to be part of an innovative team and innovative, innovative workplace, you need to be able to work well with others, to be able to respectfully challenge their ideas, to build off their suggestions, and be comfortable with them challenging you as well. Now, at this point, it should be pretty clear, soft skills, very important for innovation. The cool thing though is soft skills are also really important for working in a distributed environment. Innovation was a thing before COVID, so these skills were already on the rise before March this year. But this new way of working, a whole bunch of you mentioned it before that you're working from home, the work environment is more flexible, it's different. This new way of working has really enhanced this need for us to to grow our soft skills. And the types of skills you need really are things like facilitation. 
This has typically been the, the responsibility of, say, a, a project manager or a business analyst. You know, they're, they're good at organising everybody into discussion. But if you're a developer and you need to solve a complex problem with other developers and they're not in the room, you're using some sort of video conference, you need to keep that conversation on track and you need to make sure it comes to a resolution. And to do that, you're using facilitation skills. And it's much more important when you're using video conferencing because communication is just easier when you're in person. You can write on a whiteboard, you can point to things. So now in the new world, facilitation is becoming more and more important. Mindfulness also has a huge role to play in our new ways of working. People usually think I'm a crazy hippie when I suggest this, but hear me out. So mindfulness is the ability to stay focused in the moment on what you're doing at any point in time. When we're working from home, this is super important because we have somebody, you know, bringing a delivery to our door. We've got a kid barking next to us. Uh, maybe our video is on and no one can see us so we can be distracted by our mobile phones. So in order to maintain our effectiveness when we're working from home, being able to apply mindfulness techniques to stay focused is vitally important. Now, it's important during the workday, but it's also important at the end of the day when you switch off because it's harder to leave work behind when you work and live in the same place. So mindfulness techniques will also enable you to switch off at the end of the day and then give your family, your friends, the full focus when you're with them. And this is really, really pivotal for staying uh working in a sustainable pace and staying mentally well uh, in a really challenging uh, working environment. These three skills, they should look familiar. They're the skills we need for innovation. And interestingly, they're also skills that we need for working in a distributed environment. We need empathy. Okay, the person that we're talking to on the other end of a call might have a really bad internet connection and it's maybe making it hard to communicate and empathy enables us to not get angry with them but then to just use our creativity to come up with a way that we can communicate with that person potentially not over a video call can we work asynchronously can we work in a google doc or something like that that doesn't require so much bandwidth and obviously it's really important to be able to collaborate even when you're not in the same location. We still need to be able to work together for an outcome. So one of the things that is super cool about soft skills is that they're not just going to help you overcome one of the challenges that we're facing as we move forward in the industry. The same skills will help you to differentiate yourself from the robots, They'll enable you to contribute to innovation and they're going to enable you to work effectively and stay sane in a globalised world where you're working in a distributed way. Um, and on, honestly, they're probably also going to help you uh, with Tinder. <laughs> so we may find ourselves asking how we can level up in this crazy COVID world that we find ourselves in. What impact has COVID had on our own learning and development? I think the main point here is that many learning methods have become so much more accessible now because the world has had no choice but to overcome its fear of remote work. One of the ways that you could upskill yourself is to learn by consuming information. And one of the activities in that would be plain old reading a book. It may feel really last century, but we can still read books and we'll share a recommended book list with you afterwards, specifically for soft skill reading. You can also look authors up online and read their blogs, Twitter or LinkedIn instead if you want shorter bursts of information. So if we move on, you can see that even a cat can do it. We have no excuse. If you learn better by accessing information via audio, Podcasts or audiobooks may be a more suitable uh, solution for you. And you could have a look at any of the audio subscription platforms to take advantage of this really affordable wealth of knowledge available to you. Another method, another method, excuse me, to learn is by doing something. 
Which brings us over to hands-on experience. It's been proven that learning through practice simply sticks better in our brains than reading or hearing about something. You can gain hands-on experience by finding someone you can bounce ideas around with, pairing up with them, and trying out something new. Another meaningful way to learn is to get a little help from someone you look up to and you can trust. And this would mean finding yourself a mentor. I'd like to share this quote with you by Ken Beck about his time mentoring software engineers at Facebook. He specifically noticed that engineers required very little support learning new technical skills, and they find it more difficult to acquire soft skills on their own. So if you are looking for a mentor, find yourself someone to look up to, to give some time to you and observe you and share feedback with you. Another way in which you can learn is by accessing any of the online platforms like Udemy. You can learn anything from drawing cute cartoon characters to game design to labor relations. So you really have nothing to lose. You can learn wherever you are, wherever you, whenever you want to, at your own pace. And generally, these courses are really affordable. In an organizational context, you can also create learning paths to share with others helping to sculpt a culture of learning and sharing in your organization. Okay, sorry to oh. interrupt you. We have a lot of questions, actually. So our first question from the audience is, should we be scared by AI? <laughs> and in particular, the suggestion that uh, the result uh, may, re it may result in sorry, homogeneity. Huh. Um, that's a really interesting question, and I think there, there's a few different lenses in which to, to kind of think about should we be afraid of them. I, like we're kind of saying today, I don't think you should be afraid of them from the perspective that they're not going to completely eliminate your job as a developer. They're just going to change the focus of it. I do think, and this kind of goes to, to uh, the earlier talk um, that was before us. There, there is a fear in terms of the way that we're creating uh, our AI. I'm not an expert in it, but one of the fears that I have is who is creating this, this artificial intelligence? Uh, what sort of biases are we introducing into the AI that we create? Are we using a diverse enough uh, group of people to design the model? Uh, and what are the impacts of training models on historical data that probably has within it entrenched biases as well? So it's not my area of expertise uh, in any way, shape or form, but I would absolutely say that uh, a lot of work needs to be done around kind of the ethics of how we're creating uh, AI models and making sure that they're actually representative of the type of world that we want to create. Okay, uh, thank you. And the next question is from Adit, and he wants to know about any ethical concerns. Oh, <laughs> everything I just said, right? I don't just um, exactly. <laughs> yeah, and like you know, earlier this year there was um, there was a scandal around um, the Apple uh, credit card, and that uh, a husband and wife pair who had exactly the same sort of financial standing were offered completely different credit limits by, by Apple where the husband's was, you know, dramatically higher and really challenging, you know, why were two people treated entirely differently by uh, the model that was deciding the credit limits and was there a bias in that model towards um, offering more, um, a higher credit limit to men rather than women? So there's definitely... Um, you know, examples of that. And I don't think gender is the only um, lens that we need to, to be concerned about. Um, you might have seen the video online of um, a person of colour using an automatic soap dispenser. And when they put their, their hands under the soap dispenser, it didn't recognise their hands were there. But when they put white tissue um, on top of their hands and used it, it dispensed soap. So that hadn't been trained to be used by people who had... Um, different colour skin than um, probably the white people that, that who created it. So definitely we need to be thinking about diversity and inclusion in the all of the, the sort of AI that we create. Okay, okay. okay. Um, one of the things that came up in this that um, it needs, uh, creativity needs a uh, surrounding of um, 
peace of mind and calmness mm. and in order to 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 thrive um what is your take on uh, the boring day daily <laughs> struggles of income i mean in order to achieve something like that, that um, soft skills can be developed, that we go into more creativity uh, on, on human on the human side, um, there needs to be security, especially financial security and um, a basic universal income. Do you think it's a thing of the future? Uh -huh. <laughs> Adeline, did you want to answer this or do you want me to take it? Wow. Um... I don't know if it's a thing of the future. Um, it, it seems that it would have a massive impact on people's lives if we could get something like that going. But whether it's actually going to happen, I don't know. Elise? <laughs> so I, I giggled at this question because I love this question so much. Um, I'm a huge proponent of having a, a base um, income for all people. And I think there's a lot of research that shows that that it's really beneficial um, and I, I 100% agree. I think, you know, when we talk about AI coming um, and taking over jobs, what my hope is, is that it takes the jobs that don't rely on human creativity and they give everybody the space um, and the comfort to focus on things uh, that better utilize our talents as, as human beings. So it's one of the things that I'm super interested in. Um, and then I don't want to minimize the question about like how do you create time and space to, to be creative when, when you've got the pressures of, of earning an income and providing a family. That, that is very real. Um, but just as one small thing that you, you can do if you can create that space or that time for yourself is even something like a 10-minute um, 10, 10 meditation can be really useful to get yourself um, being more mindful mindful and being able to more focus on creativity as well as just moving away from the problem so if you can go for a 15 minute walk where you can step away from a problem that's a key part of the creativity process um, if you look up any of the sort of theories around creativity and John Cleese has a really great talk about it you'll know that stepping away from a problem is a really key part of giving your brain the space to subconsciously continually um address that problem and find new connections between the ideas that you have. And that's a super important part of creativity. So create space for yourself and hopefully universal income happens. Well, that is also another great question that came up in the chat. Is it, um, as you just mentioned, stepping it out into a 15 minutes walk or something. Um, do you think that creativity can be learned? And do you think that um, meditation could be an, um, an entry technique into creativity? Yes and yes. Um, <laughs> meditation can help, as I said before, to step you out of where you are currently and just let your mind go. Uh, but you can also meditate on a particular problem and you can think about things from the perspective of, of a customer. So you can do an empathetic meditation uh, and you can look on YouTube and you'll find some guided meditations around these sorts of things. So that can really help you to, to understand the customer's perspective um, or whoever you're, you're designing for from, from different angles. Um, in terms of can creativity be taught? Absolutely. Typically, we've expected creativity to be about like drawing things or like making pretty pictures, um, but it's really about finding new solutions to problems. And like I said in the talk, it's very rare that one person just has the whole solution. So even if you struggle to, um, to do the first level ideation, it's something I struggle with. What I'm good at is building off other people's ideas. And there are certain techniques that you can use to help yourself build on other people's ideas. So you can look to um, improv theater. I know it sounds mm -hmm. crazy. They have a technique called yes and. So when you're doing an improvisation um, comedy sketch, you're never ever allowed to say no to the person that you're improvising with. You have to say yes and then build on their idea. And so doing little practices where you're, you're not working on the actual problems you're trying to solve, but you use that technique to practice never saying no to something, but always trying to find the good part of it and then suggesting a tweak or something else you could do on top of it. 
that's just one technique that you can use to, to start improving your creativity. There's a whole host of different like co-design, drawing together, whole bunch of different techniques that you can find um, and the internet will be a big help or you can connect with us afterwards and we can try and point you in the right direction. Okay, let's try it. Yes, and thank you so much for this thank interesting you. talk. It was really amazing and uh, eye-opening. And I think also our audience had quite some fun. There had been good interaction. And it was great to have you around. Um, have a great day. Uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. I hope to, that you tune in into other talks, even that they might be a little bit more technical, but I guess they're still great yeah. um, topics. Out for now. See you soon. Yeah.